recording. So we'll quit housekeeping things while we are meeting. Um, anything, especially those of you who are joining us remotely, please remain muted until you are ready to contribute to the discussion. So that way we cut down on background noise. Um, anything that you say or do, whatever comes across the microphone or the video camera is a matter of public record. Um, we are here live. It's Monday night at CDFS in Effingham. It is still March 18, 2024. And in just a moment, we'll get started with our LVA 23 quarterly board meeting um, with our board chair, Gerald Filiu. So whenever you are ready, Gerald, you can call the meeting. All right. We'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. If you're still eating, go ahead and eat. Just I hope I don't have any salad in my teeth. <laughs> just just that side. <laughs> All right. So well, welcome everyone. Uh, nice spring day, wasn't it? Beautiful. So anyway, let, let's get started. Let's get started. So uh Debbie, or ask for a roll call, please. Here. Emma Here. Can I Here. 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 All right. Thank you all very much. <laughs> so <laughs> Debbie had sent out the minute from the last meeting. I assume <clears throat> I hope everyone has had time to review those. Um, do I have a motion to accept the minutes as presented, please? Anybody? So many. Okay, Josh and Sandy. Okay. Does anyone have any corrections to the minutes? Any issues that they saw? I saw none. Uh, if none, all those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, same time. And Debbie, I finally voted on the minutes. Mm -hmm. okay. So, are there any conflict of interest uh, in the seating team that anyone knows of? All right, that's good. So, we're going to go on to a summary. Summary. A summary. Summary. <laughs> of a regional plan. Jamie, take it away. Right. An emphasis on the summary. <laughs> a lot of people put a lot of time on this. So, summary. Right, right. Chris? So, summary means we're going to read 114 page document. <laughs> no, we're not. I'm going to do a quick summary and hit the highlights for you. So the purpose of the regional plan was to create a workforce development system that increases employment retention and earnings, as well as the occupational skill attainment by the participants in our region. We want to improve self-sufficiency and enhance productivity and competitiveness of the region, and we want to do it as a group, as a team. I'm letting Carolyn Jorgensen from the waiting room. So this was all of us getting together to decide on that plan. We had terrific stakeholder engagement. I'm not going to read all of these organizations and agencies, but there were a ton. We had wonderful turnout. We had meetings in December and then every Wednesday in January, except for the last Wednesday, the fifth Wednesday. Um, really good input, very high level engagement, great discussions, a lot of spin off rabbit hole discussions as well, which in certain times and places are great. So we got a lot of really good. Um, stuff to think about even for the next cycle of regional things. So 
quick overview of the workforce analysis that came up the regional plan. Um, the target industries we're focusing on are the same that we did in the previous cycle as well. So manufacturing, construction and building, healthcare and social assistance, education, and then transportation, distribution, and logistics. The in-demand occupations we're focusing on, um, nursing, including RNs, LPNs, and PNAs, automotive technicians, mechanics, EMTs, and paramedics, physical therapy assistants, teachers assistants, and child care workers, and then truck drivers, both heavy and tractor trailer truck drivers, and then industrial maintenance technicians as well. The challenges that we um, analyzed and looked at for the workforce are decline of traditional industries, population decline and brain drain, limited access to capital, infrastructure deficiencies, skills mismatch, mismatch and workforce development, limited diversification of economy and sectors. Perception and marketing was a big one. That came up in our regional planning and also when we talked um, with economic development in their five-year plan, perception and marketing came up as well. And then policy and regulatory barriers, of course. The highest employment needs, um, as far as like employability skills go, motivation, professional etiquette, employability skills in general, organization and time management, communication and baseline skills for each of the sectors. We did a um, SWOT of our services available in the region. We have a lot of strength. We do have some really good opportunities that we are actively capitalizing on and working towards. Um, and then there are some weaknesses that we acknowledge and that we need to reinforce. And then there's some threats that we are poised to, to mitigate going forward. Our goals, we came up with six goals. Illinois had three big ones, and we came up with basically two for each of those three Illinois goals. Um, to read the actual, the entire description of the goal, the timeline, and the deliverables, that is in the regional plan, but just real quick, all of our goals align with Illinois state goals. Um, we had it, I think we got to like 11 goals, and we whittled it down to six. So be sure to take a look at those goals. Um, the timelines of those and how each of the partners are responsible for certain goals and how we're going to work together to attain them over the next four years. So the key strategies that we are using to reach those goals, they're going to sound pretty familiar because they're the key strategies that we use often. We're putting new spins on some of them, more um, vigor, you're reinvigorating some of these strategies, and we're taking new innovative approaches. So sector-based approach is a big one. It's aligning our training providers in our industry so that we are producing the skilled workers that our region needs. Apprenticeship expansion, we have the apprenticeship grant. We plan on continuing to um, receive that or at least apply for it for the next five years and moving to a formula model. So I'm pretty certain we're going to be receiving it for the next four um, years of that five-year grant. Focus on work-based learning opportunities, support for disadvantaged populations, of course, and then technology integration. That is a big one where we're looking to how can we work together as an ecosystem with all these different technologies um, and make them work for us and help our service to be more accessible. So our targeted populations, of course, are youth, veterans, individuals with disabilities, and those who are unemployed or underemployed. So the next step is that you all have to approve this regional plan. From there, we will submit to DCO by March 31st. Um, they use a contract um, KEB, I don't know exactly what it stands for, but the contract organization reviews all of these regional plans and they will come back and make some recommended revisions or tell us to make recommended revisions. That will probably happen in late May, June-ish, and we'll have to have those submitted before um, July 1st when the plan goes into effect. From there, July 1st of 2024 through June, June 30th of 2028, we are making these things happen. We are implementing all those strategies. We are striving to reach those goals, and we will have a system in place to monitor our progress and set us up for continuous improvement. So ta-da, how's that for a summary? I bet you thought I would be up here for a long time. Give the gal another brownie. All right, we'll go ahead with our committee reports. So oversight. 
Mike? Oversight met on Thursday, uh, March 14th at 4.30 here. I need to discuss the following fiscal agent reports, service provider reports, and we talked a little bit about the Title I service provider contract updates. Um, all the reports were approved and I'll be brought to the board today as you can see in the next three or four sessions. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Mike. Anybody have a question? Mike? Not the only word there. There you go. So, no. Kayla would have been, but she has not called in yet. So, okay, well, we'll, we'll move on down. I can hear you. You feel like it? Go for it. Uh, I'm not really prepared, prepared, but yes. Wow, I will, step it up. I um, will move on with you. Um, we met today at three o'clock. We reviewed minutes from the last meeting. We talked about updates, updates on phase three and the progress we're making toward that what our next meeting plan is, and how we'll be working on our strategic plan for youth. We heard from Kelly, she reported on activities and programs that are going on with the youth committee. She also, also shared some information in the recruitment plan, um, the additional business contacts that they've made. They have seven new youth with an additional four coming on soon and some very strong possibilities. Um, they had set some goals out for their career planners with three additional contacts, three additional youth brought into the program, and 10 contacts per week for additional work sites for work experience. I think that concludes my report for Youth Committee. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Absorption is Kevin. Oh, can you hear me? There, now we can hear you. It's getting easy. Yes, Kevin, go ahead with your report. All right. <laughs> Chris, do you feel like you've been <laughs> <laughs> um, We met this afternoon at four o'clock. We did have a presentation from Julie Corinne on our Perkins program. Um, not only at Lakeland College, but all the community colleges have a Perkins program. She shared information about students that are eligible for the program and some of the other things within the community college that Perkins would be able to pay, to, pay for. Devin gave an update on our business service team. He talked about our Leap Forward event that was held on February 29th. We talked about eighth grade career conference for our eighth graders coming up in just a couple of weeks on campus. At our next business service team meeting, we're gonna be talking about a business satisfaction survey. Devin also talked about the Manufacturing Collaborative that's coming up on April 3rd from 2 to 4. Tony gave updates on the MOU and where we're at with MOU. Kelly gave updates from the One Stop Operator meeting. We didn't have any additional agenda items. We had partner reports from Adult Ed, Perkins, and DRS. Joy also shared that she is looking for additional sector partners in the area of healthcare and law enforcement for a great career day. So if anybody would be able to refer a business or someone who would be able to help Joy out and um, talk to eighth graders about their career choices, she is would love to get those referrals. So that was healthcare. Law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And we adjourned at 4.41 with our next meeting on June 17th. Very good, Chris. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, there is no executive report. There's no executive meetings. So with that, uh, may I have a motion to accept the reports as presented, please? Yes, Courtney made motion and Kathy made a second. All those in favor, say aye. All, right. All those opposed, same time. All right, thank you very much. All right, Kelly. Okay. All right, service provider report. Okay. 
Okay, so the last time we met, um, we had talked a little bit about the Illinois Solutions Act and that it was going to go back on January 1st. Um, the state was doing a little consideration to possibly exempt the um, public experience. However, that did not work out. So we have created a policy and procedure at CFS and it was um, implemented. And we are now um, allowing our work experience for every 40 hours that they work, they gain an hour of flex time. So that we did um, get that taken care of. Um, Elaine and I, thank you Elaine for working so hard on the RFP. We did submit that on February 8th. And we were hoping that they do. Um, we also um, did not actually receive the emergency grant money um, for our flood rapid response. However, we um, are anticipating that any day, right, Debbie? <laughs> <laughs> so we have enrolled 37 um, dislocated workers at this time. Um, most of those are from Quad. I think we have eight from other layoffs. We also um, received notice that um, Sunray Coal in uh, Crawford County is laying. I'm oh, sorry, is it Lawrence? I thought it was Crawford. Lawrence. Oh, okay. We'll give them credit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Black Rock, all I know. Actually, Russ, Russ, I mailed it. <laughs> okay, well, we need to notice that um, this company is <laughs> based in Indiana, but it does have an operation in Buffaloville. And um, so we we tried to get a rapid response going. However, I think Trevor from the state is having a lot of difficulty getting in touch with the company. Um, so, Elaine. Um, took care of the Illinois residents and sent out um, our information packing to them. And um, I don't think we've heard from anyone yet, but mm -hmm. I have great optimism, John. <laughs> <laughs> They've actually been off work for almost two months now. So mm -hmm. yeah, they're not able to run clean it yet, but it is, but they got the war notice in late, so they had to pay them for 16 days. Right. So it hasn't come to the time of 60 days yet. So once that runs out, then they'll be able to apply. Um, also, as Chris was talking about our um, youth recruitment plan, we are, and it's no secret, we're having a little trouble with meeting that 20% um, work based um, measure. And so we have we've done this recruitment plan where our 10 career planners are hopefully going to gain three work experience um, or OGC um, participants by April 1st. It's a strong, aggressive goal, but they are working really hard. They're really getting out there making a lot of business contacts. We've probably made three or 400 contacts um, trying to get you on. So we have a lot, you know, hopefully it's coming in soon. Um, I don't know. We did receive the youth supplemental grant from the state, and we are um, working to get that money spent. <laughs> and um, we have there a total of 253 people so far this year. Yeah. Any questions? <laughs> Any referrals would be lovely. Okay, any out of school you 16 to 24 years old, please send them our way. Thanks, Kelly, very much. All right, Morgan. I am the seven fiscal agent report. That's Jane. A summer. I mean, you guys can't get lucky two times in a row. All right. I'm going to try to share this screen, but my mouse is doing something wonky, so give me just a moment. Bear with me. Yes, I'm going to I'm going to connect to Lee Smith from uh, Starbucks. All right, so 
You got off easy one time. This one's going to take a little bit more time, but not significantly more time. So the incumbent worker project that you are seeing on your screens now, this is a banner year for incumbent worker training. Okay. Typically, um, we were averaging between about seven, between seven and 10 every year. Last year, I think our inch total came to 13 projects, if I remember correctly. And right now we're at like what, 15, 97, something like that, a lot. So we are definitely um, taking names and just knocking down doors when it comes to incumbent worker training. There's a lot of really good training go going on right now. You may notice we are very manufacturing heavy and that's typical. I would love to get more diversity going on with our incumbent worker training projects. So think out of the box and if you know of any um, businesses that are looking to upskill their current worker workers and they are in a different sector than manufacturing, we'd love to connect with them and see what other incumbent worker projects we can come up with. Real quick, we'll go over some grant modifications and new funding. We have submitted modifications to our PY21, 22, and 23 formula grants. PY21 and 22, those mods were to satisfy a 10% budget line reallocation policy that DCO didn't really enforce. And then after the fact, came back and said, wait, we need to do um, a bond budget mod. So we had moved money in budget lines. Everything was fine. We didn't ask for additional money, but then afterwards they came back and said, well, we actually need a modification. And if I remember correctly, PY21, since it was after the grant closeout, we even had to go through an additional step for that. But again, that was not so much that we did anything wrong. It was that DCO did not enforce a policy that they forgot that they had, and then we had to go back and redo some stuff. Um, we will be, or we will be, Bring me up to speed real quick. Mondays are always like a whole new day for me. Whole new week. Um, PY23, we have done the modification to move 1D to 1A. We submitted it, I went to Josh, and the accounting office lost it. So, so he turned it back into them last week. So hopefully they will change those numbers. So. Thank you. Yes, our plan is to move money from 1D to 1A because we'll get that emergency quad graphic rapid response money and use that to satisfy to serve people who were in the 1D line. And that way we can address um, waiting lists that we have. So lots of mods going on. We also have to have the Apprenticeship Navigator 2.0. That grant is the year one of our five-year recurring grant. Um, and it was done a little bit differently. So they were calling it Navigator 2.0. We applied for $89,000 for um, July of 23 to June of 24, but we were unable to source a navigator for Devon until October. So we are de-obligating some of that money that we had allocated for salary and fringe, and then we're reallocating um, 10,000 to employer incentives. So we can try to incentivize employers to develop registered apprenticeship programs um, a little more quickly. We also have the Supplemental um, General Revenue Fund grant, $269,000 for that, that has come through. And we are poised to receive Rapid Response 1 e grant money any day now, we've been told, of $673,000. Yes, sir. The Apprenticeship Navigator 2.0, you said this, that's year one of five? Yes. For the 2.0. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're calling it this year 2.0, and I don't know what we're calling it starting July 1st. I think they're coming up with a different terminology because this is the first year of a new grant cycle, but they're kind of using it as a continuation of the last grant cycle where we had Nate Carlson as our- uh, well, That's what I was leader. curious on. If, if it's been, it seems like it's been more than one year. It, it feels like it, but <laughs> this is the first year of a whole new grant that is going to take a different look. So as of July, it's, there's going to be a formula component where each area receives a determined amount based on some algorithm, I'm sure. But then there will also be a competitive component where we could apply. So far, last year and this year has just been competitive. As of July 1st, we'll have a formula every year and then the option for competitive. Illinois is opting not to do competitive for this next year coming up as of July 1st, but in the future, we will likely have competitive options. So we have the option for four more years. Correct. The Department of Labor grant to DCO is a five-year grant. 
and we're in year one now about to start year two but we're calling this 2.0 just to use you all that is the only reason transition year so moving from the old model into the new model navigator 2.0 i keep wanting to click there i feel like a weather girl all right um just a real quick update on the apprenticeship expansion grant the talent pipeline management academy is complete Devin is a certified practitioner of TPM, Town Pipeline Management. And we also have two members of our business service team who are uh, practitioners now. Devin also recently attended the Apprenticeships for America conference in Washington, D.C. He coordinated the employer event, Leap Forward with LEA 23 on February 29th, where we had 28 employers or participants join us for um, a really wonderful workshop and um, discussion event. And there are several registered apprenticeship programs in development currently. Just a real quick update on talent pipeline management. We now have all these great practitioners in our area. So we are hitting the ground running with reviving the TPM collaboratives or round tables or sector partnerships that we already had established and going last year. So on April 8th, I'm sorry, April 3rd, we are reconvening our manufacturing collaborative. So if you have any connections with local manufacturing employers who are thinking long-term how to solve talent pipeline issues in short-term, they have some, some issues currently that they're looking for some help with, send them our way. We would love to get them to the roundtable discussion to get their input and to start um, leading them through the process of going through the talent pipeline management strategies. We also intend to get healthcare, childcare, and possibly even IT going in the next few months. This is, it sounds like a lot and it sounds very optimistically aggressive, and it is. But these talent pipeline management strategies are long term strategies. So this is just starting out and starting to work through those strategies. We're not saying that we are going to complete entire collaboratives through six strategies and doing 10 years worth of planning all in just a few months. In the next few months, we will be getting some collaboratives started and moving forward through the process. On the horizon, also, we have the annual monitoring is most likely for us going to happen in May. It usually happens mid-May-ish. Um, I believe we were told they seem to be running a couple weeks ahead of schedule. Was it ahead or was it behind schedule? Ahead of schedule, so we, we haven't got our exact dates yet, but we are ready for anything. And then we will begin planning for our plan year 24, also known as fiscal year 25 budget process in April. We traditionally get our allocations um, about mid-May-ish, um, but we like to get a head start and try to get the right pieces into place. So as soon as we do get those allocations for our area, we're able to hit the ground running and get that budget process done. Um, and then for LEA 23 board staff at Lakeland, our summer hours start May 17th. So we will work 10 hours each day um, and then Fridays have that day off. So we'll still get to our 40 hours, but close on Fridays. So that makes summer time go super fast. Super fast. We've already talked about eighth grade career conference a couple times, but I want to bring it to your attention again. On April 11th and 12th, Lakeland College and um, EPs, East, Eastern Illinois Education for Employment System 340 are working together to put on the 8th grade career conference. Um, business service team uh, participants will be on hand to help out and support the businesses and the students there. And I encourage you to spread word about the wonderful event. We are still looking for some career presenters, specifically in healthcare and law enforcement or public safety. But I don't think Joy is going to be too picky about anyone who wants to be a career presenter, no matter what sector or career cluster they represent. Um, 2,000 students over two days, four sessions, morning and afternoon for those two days. You can attend one session or all four, spread the word. And if you're interested in presenting to eighth graders and talking to them about your career pathway and how you got to where you're at and inspire them, I highly encourage you to register. You can connect with Joy or you can um, ask me and I'll send you the registration link. And then the Wheel of Summit for 2024 is happening April 24th and 25th. I encourage you all to attend. It is a great event. There's a ton of Wheel of information. Um, 
This year, there's an in-person option and there's a virtual option. In-person will be held in Collinsville. Um, and I believe on the 23rd, the day before the summit, there are some employer um, tours. Uh, the factory that makes customized Ford Bronco trucks. There's a factory that makes or customizes um, private airplanes. And then there was one more employer that I already forgot that was really interesting. Like, it would be worth just to show up and check out those really cool employers and for their facilities and what they're doing. But on top of that, the summit is great. There's a ton of information. There's great networking opportunities to see what other OEAs are doing and other workforce partners are doing that's innovative and think of ways that we can bring those practices and strategies to our area. Um, I think it's $100 registration for virtual attendees and in-person is 150. You can ride with me if you want to. If you have time, please consider going to the WIOA Summit. This is It's intended for board members, for partners, anyone and everyone who is a WIOA affiliate. And then I want to congratulate our board members who have perfect attendance. And let me tell you, this list is longer than it was the same time last year. So that, that's looking good. We're on the right track. So thank you to Gerald, to Casey Berkholzer, to Kevin, to Mike Conrad, Lori Foreman, who happened to play the to Chris, who is there all the time, and to all the meetings, um, to Jason and to Courtney Yonke. I appreciate you all so much. Thank you for being so highly engaged and motivated because that is what keeps us going. So thank you for your attendance. Thank you for your leadership and for your time and for everything that you do for the local workforce. Bless you. And then, uh, again, shameless plug, our workforce podcast, WIN. This is a very useful tool in getting information out to anyone and everyone. The, the episodes are recorded. You can share them. You can download them. We can take snippets of any that you're interested in to share. Um, but if anyone asks, what is WIOA or what is this partner doing? There is probably an episode for it. The most recent episode released, I think, was episode 38. And that was me and Kelly talking about her new role at CEFS and all the really cool things that she does for the participants and what she's excited to bring to the table as the director. Um, and I highly encourage you to check it out. It's also on YouTube, but we don't really want you to watch that video. So go ahead and stream it and download it on a platform for podcasts, please. And then, yes follow us on social media. I know you hear about social media all the time. It almost gets to be uh, a chore, but our priceless engagement that it comes through social media and that organic sharing and interaction of posts is what is going to drive up the visibility and awareness of VOA and LEA 23. So as you um, are just doing scrolling one night, check out LEA 23 and share we're on facebook instagram linkedin and then we have of course all of our meeting recordings um podcasts everything else on youtube check those out as well and then this look at that any questions for the um fiscal agent thank you very much okay <clears throat> jamie has already provided us with a summary of the regional plan and now we get to approve that but do you want have anything you want to add to that to your comments or does anyone have any questions for me please approve it <laughs> <laughs> a lot of hard work when you do a lot of work a lot of people spend a lot of time just, whether you just tuned in and listen to the conversation which that's what i do a lot um just to learn more about the process. Yeah. Yes, sorry. quick comment. Jamie and their team really did an excellent job working through this process. And she noted uh, early on a lot of little rabbit holes that we dove into, and, and she did a good job getting the group back in order and on track to move through the process. So great goes for the uh, good leadership. Yeah. Thank you all who tuned in, who contributed, and even if it was just listening, knowing that you were there and that you were engaged and actively learning, that is what meant a lot. And 
I could write all kinds of reports, but it would not be a valuable, useful report or plan without your contribution. So thank you for all of you in this room and anyone who's online who um, participated. Greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate it. All right, with that, let's have a motion to approve the regional plan. Who wants to be the elected? Kevin, make the motion. <laughs> thank you, Kevin. All I, right. I found a microphone. <laughs> I have a perfect attendance, so I had to show up once, right? Uh, how about a second? No, second, please. Second. All right. Thank you, Chris. All those in favor, say aye. 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 And I dare anyone to say no, but all those opposed say yes. <laughs> all right. Thank you all very much. Thank you all very much. Approved, Jamie. Put that one aside, everybody. Okay. So uh, we moved to num number nine, uh, Title I Service Provider Contract Update. Jamie's got some updates she'd like to give us on that, and uh, I'll give the floor to her. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to let you all know that after careful consideration, it has been determined that this process may have not been conducted in full compliance with the fiscal agent's procurement policy and or the federal regulations pertaining to competitive bidding and procurement guidelines. So as a result, we have initiated a pause on all of the activities related to the we owe a Title I service provider request for proposal process. The legal team is currently reviewing the situation to ensure that all procedures align with the necessary federal regulations. And until the review is complete and a recommendation is made, all activities related to the process remain on hold. Um, so that means we're not able to announce a decision on Thursday when we planned, nor here at this board meeting today as we intended all this time. We understand that the importance of providing timely updates and actively, we are actively working to try to expedite that process. I was hopeful that we would even get notice this morning or this afternoon before today's meeting, um, but they're still working on it. So at this time, we don't have a clear timeline for when the decision will be reached. I have no idea if it will be late tonight, in the middle of the night, if it'll be tomorrow or if it'll be next week. The moment that I have any inkling of when that process will be, I will inform everybody. We want to assure you that urgency is being prioritized and we are keeping the bidders informed as soon as we receive that further instruction from the legal team. So I want to just apologize for the inconvenience um, that this pause causes and for the undue stress, duress that we've all been waiting on pins and needles. I'm sorry, uh, we'll have to wait just a wee bit longer, and I appreciate your understanding and cooperation as we work through the matter. And if you have any questions or concerns, I'm happy to try to answer them, but I have limited information at this time. If I don't have an answer, I will do my best to get the answer for you as quickly as possible. So, what questions do we have? Yes, sir. Uh, what process changed from the past? We um, had these procedures done in the past that was accepted. From my understanding, I don't think anything has changed. However, I've not been part of the process. Um, it's been reviewed that we've had board policy for the process, but we should have been following fiscal agent policy for the process. And those two things are not aligned. So the attorneys are reviewing to see if that is indeed the fiscal agent process should be what we were following or the board policy. What was the difference? The Lakeland board policy says that all the procurement has to go through the business department and that the bids all have to be open in a public setting with a board member and multiple people present. Our process did not have a public opening of the bids. Well, I don't like on some county levels, uh, if it's a professional service that sometimes you don't require to take a uh, sealed bid, that Possibly the case here. For Lakeland's board policy, anything that is federal grant dollars in excess of $250,000 does have to go through that bidding process. So it's more or less Lakeland's. The fiscal agent's policy. Okay. Yes. So not this board's policy or right, state DCO. 
if like lands policy. DCO says that we have to follow whatever the federal legislation is. And yes, federal leg legislation does say that there could be a difference between service um, of certain amounts. And if there's, like you were saying earlier, there's professional specific professionals. So it's, we're determining, do we go aligned with what Lakeland says, because that is more stringent than the federal guidelines even, or do we defer to the federal guidelines of 2 CFR 200 parts 317 through 321? I think, if I remember right. So it's a grade above those, but then practice, not something we did here right here. Correct. Yeah. Just to make sure that everyone on the same page, because the fiscal agent, Lakeland, is who signed the contract with the service provider. Thank you. How many bids were submitted? We received two bids. Any other questions? You've been asking ones I could actually answer. So. <laughs> What's through the red flag? <laughs> I don't think there was a red flag. There was just interest in how our process goes. And I was unable to answer some of those questions. So then I had to do more asking. And the more that we asked, we realized wait, this isn't in alignment with Lakeland's policy. So who, who is the first submitted? CEFS and career team. <laughs> Where's career team? They are based out of Connecticut, but they have, um, we owe contracts across the United States, some in Texas, some in Washington State, I want to say Kentucky maybe, several different states. So if they were awarded the contract, how would they perform the services that Thess does here? I mean, would they hire staff and have them locally? Yes, they put all that into their proposal. So they have a thought out plan of how they would implement their services here. And that's part of what the review team would look at in those two proposals and then decide which made more sense. It does not necessarily have to be who is the chief or who could do it for the least amount of money. Um, it would be who could provide the best service for our area. So how far along in the process did we get before? Almost to the end. So you had to actually chosen someone? We had not. We received the review, the proposals, and we were reviewing them. Well, then who will make the ultimate decision? Ultimately, it would be the, so if we go by Lakeland board policy, the business department does go through the process of the bid, but they defer to the expertise of the department whose service it is, who's going to do the service. So they would refer to us, our review committee. Okay, we'll walk you through the steps to make sure that everything is in alignment with board policy, but ultimately the decision is made by the department. So our review committee, our board, would still be the ones that make the ultimate decision. So what are you talking about right. the CEOs or this board? Uh, it, it's a board decision. The board approves it. Our planning and oversight committee takes the recommendation to the board. Right, Tony? Yeah. I didn't say that right. That's not something that the CEOs have to approve after the board? You know, On the contract, I do believe board chair and CEO, lead CEO signed that contract as well. So the board, CEO board would have to approve. Yes. The board has a lot of that. Yes. As I understand it, that's correct. We always, in this county, used to remind me, the attorneys always tell us when in doubt, when in public. <laughs> when in public, no matter what. We're building a big, big jail, and we got to do a lot of sessions where we go to the beds, but it, it just keeps everything going. Transparent. So what you're saying in your county, when you have a highway department uh, engineering firm, how do you pick your engineering firm? Do you take bids? Well, then, now, wait a minute. That's a different... That's, that's kind of what we're talking about here, too. Oh, that's, okay, well, that's that's a professional... They, and that's what takes it well, we interview and take in, and then we do it on a points basis, and it's totally transparent. Yeah. Yep. 
And that's what we have as well as the rubric. The only difference would be with the big front open and bubble. But we do at some point, we don't know the documents originally, then we go in and deliver it. Yeah. Well, Debbie, Kevin, Jamie, I know this has to be disappointing for you all. Okay. But uh, we'll work through it. We'll be fine. It'll be good. Okay. Yeah. I think the most important thing here is they're seeking <laughs> professional opinion from the attorneys to ensure that we don't put the grant in jeopardy and ensure that these services are going to be continuing and that it's going to be ongoing. So, you know, it, it's unfortunate the spot that we're at, but it's a hurdle. What's the best path forward? And then to ensure that it's it's done right. Correct. Right. Yeah. I'd rather take a little extra time and ensure that we're doing everything right and no one has any questions or could ever question. Um, I just know that sometimes waiting is uncomfortable, but I'm willing to be uncomfortable for a little while to make sure that we can continue on the right path for as long as possible. But ultimately, this board will make the decision and not just okay or no a recommendation. Well, planning and oversight, like you said, will review it and then make the recommendation. Okay, so it will be. Yeah. Ultimately. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, this is Kevin. And if you have to rebid it, is there a a timeline on, on how long you have to have that bid out by the Lakeland College standards? Or I'm just curious of if we're going to get it passed. June 30th, if we'll have to extend our current contract until this can be worked out? That is a good question. And I did not bring the policy with me to be able to look at. I want to say there's a 30 day minimum, but I, I, I'm i working off of a memory that is not great. So please don't quote me on that. I will find the right answer for you and get back to you ASAP. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, thank you, thank you. All right, so we'll move on to item 10. Tony, your annual duties. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so every year we have to uh, formulate a nominating committee to um, nominate a chair and vice chair to proceed over the, this board uh, for the next year. Um, so that being said, if anybody want to volunteer to do this? We had some great volunteers in the past. We did. <laughs> <laughs> they did a fantastic job. <laughs> <laughs> Those eyes were. They're everywhere. <laughs> I will serve on them. Anybody else? <laughs> Need two more. Are you talking about the committee, Tony? I am. Okay. <laughs> I guess I can help. Well, thank you, Carol. <laughs> thank you. Um, you're overwhelmingly convincing. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> Anybody else? This is Kevin. I can help. Okay, what it's going to consist of, I will give you all a list of people that are eligible to be chair and vice chair. You got to make a, phone, a couple phone calls, and then uh, and that's, that's the process it's going to take. I don't think there's going to be anybody fighting over who wants the chair and vice chair. So. All you need is Oh, exactly. <laughs> you said it, Jim. I didn't say it. I'm <laughs> So they, 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 we will go through the process of um, Kevin Casey and, and Chris to, uh, to call a couple of people. All right. Thanks, Tony. All right. Moving on to item 11. Any other business or anybody wants to share? Well, we need to oh. do action on the appointment. Appoint, yes. Thank you. We need to approve the nominating committee. Kevin, would you want to recite those names that you worked so hard to get? Uh, Chris Stroll, Casey Bergholzer, and Tim Taylor. All right. 
All right, I have a motion to approve those as a nominating committee, please. Yes, Andy? Second. And John? We appreciate it. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. And... All right, motion carried unanimously. So now we will move on to item 11, other business. Member opportunities to share something that's happened massively awesomely in their counties. All right. Yes, Courtney. Uh, locally, there's a group called 44. It's a uh, uh, citizen led community program, starts with developing long range improvement plan for the Effingham School District. Um, they have their second community engagement session coming up. This Thursday, March 21st, uh, 6.30, 8.30 at the uh, FM. Um, oh, the, no, no, just uh, down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, they at the FM Event Center. And uh, first session was really good. It was, you know, where, where we are now. The second session is going to be, you know, where do we want to go? Uh, they're actively seeking feedback from the community. You don't have to be within the Unifori School District to participate. They're seeking people from outside um, that district as well. So community as a whole, uh, there'll be a hands-on activity to uh, encourage that participation at this upcoming meeting. A really great one for the first session. There was 125, 130 people there for that one. We're hoping that it's a good showing uh, for the second one as well, but uh, this Thursday. And then I will note um, the last Thursday of the month, I always have uh, business webinars. Uh, we have the, uh, on the 28th at 10.30, the Illinois Small Business Development Centers, uh, where I've got Erica White, she's the state director of the Illinois SBDC Network. It's going to present on what SBDCs are um, and, and how to utilize them. And then we have new leadership or extensions of SBDC uh, offices servicing South Central, Southeastern Illinois. So we're going to hear from Michelle Brooks from the uh, IECC, uh, Milo Wolf. Wolf, Wolf. Wolzowski from the uh, Champaign County EDC and then Amy Patrick from uh, EA. Yeah. Yeah. So are any of your communities getting all geared up for the eclipse? Oh, huge. Yes, I knew Lawrence County was. <laughs> yes, I've got a new thing going on out at the airport. The airport. And yeah. We don't have a lot of this stuff. Yeah. Because we're, we're probably, in this group, we're the focus on the direct path and it's going to hit some of Lawrence County. Yeah. Our six deputies are going to be able to six yeah. I heard today that Dietrich has called school off that day yeah. and it's closing Dietrich down. Yeah. Businesses yeah. and everything's going to be closed down yeah. that day just because there's going to be so many people there they can't control the crowds. Wow. It's a two day celebration, though, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. Lawrence County yeah. schools are closed and Lawrenceville might be closed. Mm -hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. So we're looking forward to it. Okay. So, yeah, amazing what people will do for three minutes of darkness. Right? It's amazing. I think a lot of people are quietly hoping that it's an overcast, rainy day. <laughs> yeah. yeah nice idea. Uh, well, not that it's a, a great thing, but uh, many of you remember a year ago on uh, March 31st, a tornado that went through Crawford County. Uh, in that tornado, my sister was taken. Uh, and uh, my son's house was destroyed. But uh, they're having a service, a memorials type service on Thursday the 28th for that meant our new or at the community center, civic center, they call it that. So, but yeah, so we're planning on actually going to that. That's not a business oriented thing, but it's a really community thing. There's a lot of people together. So, yeah, that's what people that lost stuff. Yeah, we, we, there were three lives lost. My, my sister Becky was one of them, she was five children. But uh, uh, it just took a path. Uh, I mean, we're just now getting, we just got a $3.8 million grant from the federal government because our airport was totally gone, gone. Mm -hmm. They're starting to rebuild hangars. Uh, 
and now they got a three point eight million dollar grant uh, from the, the state or from the federal government to rebuild the terminal, and so uh, it's in process. It's just been a long time coming. So those things don't happen overnight, you know. And uh, just yeah, a lot, a lot of farmers lost stuff. Uh, we had a, a, a emergency situation, uh, EPA emergency. There was one of our uh, a marathon. Uh, little distribution center of oil and fuels and stuff just right south of the Gordon Junction uh, was taken out, and so yeah, it was it was pretty nasty through there for us. So when you hear about the things now that happened in Indiana, Ohio last week, we can relate to those things. You know, when you go through, we can. So why was not that not declared a FEMA disaster? You don't even want to get me started. <laughs> I guess we. With URBA, yeah. um, we helped the USDA with uh, FEMA disaster grants, yeah. and I was just blown away that they weren't declared. It. Well, well, let me let me encourage counties to do this, okay? For for your for your counties, don't think you can do it yourself. Get professional help from people that know what is needed, the criteria that's needed to meet those grants, to meet those. FEMA disaster areas and to know what's going on. Don't you get so many? I know we talked about this earlier. There's so many people that are so sick, think they're so sick and smart that I got this. I got this. We're, we don't have this. We don't know what we're doing. Get people that know. Pay them $100,000. Who cares? But if, if you can make this happen, but we have too many people that. I got it. I got it. And they didn't understand the criteria. They didn't understand the process. They didn't understand a lot of things. And we got it. <laughs> yes. On a different level, but even with the, if you're talking about being prepared uh, with the uh, lips, mm -hmm. we have a uh, health click on Illinois and EMA on getting our action plan together in case there is something that happens in mm -hmm. We've got it set up, so when they come in, they ask, where's your plan? Yeah. Here it yeah. is. Now let's go. Yeah. And, and for all you people that have been on the county board, you understand that plan. You understand how Illinois emergency management system, how they change that plan, how they revise it. And you understand on the county board, I've been through this I don't know how many times, upgrading our plan, upgrading our plan, upgrading our plan. But a county board member doesn't know what's in that plan. It's the EMS people that know what's in that plan. They're the ones to implement the plan, you know. But uh, I don't know. see, God is calling. So yeah. So anyway, you're fine. Oh, All right. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to answer any more comments. <laughs> All right. Okay. We thank you all for sharing. So, but. I do have to. I'm 12. It's public comment. <laughs> so, if anyone has a public comment, other than Walter Gordon said, I will refrain myself. <laughs> All right. If not, do I have a motion to adjourn? Anybody want to make a motion or you just want to stay here? So moved. Okay. okay. Thanks. Second? Okay. All right. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. CEOs, hang around. You've got a meeting to follow. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you all.
You know, the county, I'm not the county board. You have to have a quorum before you call people in on. Even for other boards. You have Even to have a quorum. Right. You have to have a quorum before you call anybody. The in about that change. Yeah. But we did have a quorum at the this morning, just one of the people who are CP isn't here, unfortunately. But I did have Bill on that on standby. He's traveling tonight, but he could call in. But to participate on the phone, you have to have a quorum in person, I thought. Not for Weoa districts more than 4,000 square miles. Okay. We are one of the few that. Okay, came. just want to make sure we're not in violation. If I found the cell phone up, I wanted to. You what? I don't I don't either. Well, you can't make it in. Me, me, you can't even start with that. That's what I was always taught during state of journey. But I that's that's on board. You got this, you got a little salt. You see the eye in it right now. Um, isn't there something about the majority of quorum? What does that apply to? To bring together to discuss things. So the majority of quorum that you got. 13 would be whatever that would be. So that would be half of a quorum, half the seven, so that would be four. But anybody, you know, that their their voice would be heard if there was a quorum in person to bring them in on. Yeah. Correct? Yeah, even understand. our unelected boards are that way. Yeah. Okay. Like 911. Right. The planning boards, all those have to have a Eating or foreign president. Okay. Uh, the board the 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 So, Jane, do you think this this is exempt now? I know that we are exempt from having a forum in person as long as we have everyone's agreement that we can have other people join virtually by telephone or video conference. Then we can allow that. Because we are a um, local workforce innovation area of more, and I can't remember if it's 4,000 square miles or 4,500 square miles, but we are 6,250 square miles, so we definitely fit into there. Did I ask if we are in agreement to have someone? Are we in agreement? Yeah, I think we could ask. I don't know if, if we can vote on it. Should we just say yes? Are we in agreement? I think you asked if anybody objects. Okay. Does anybody object? If we attempt to get someone online or by phone. So we're not in violation. Of the yes, if, we, if it's true, I mean, if it's the fact, if it's written in black and white. And, and we've been I aware of this it. before. Jamie's come up with this. We've I dealt with this before. Yeah. So I, that's well, what it was. Oh, okay. I just don't want to be. I just don't want to I did, yes. <laughs> Can I put a whole board without a form? That's a very good question. I haven't reviewed that policy. If you have Bill's number, maybe it might help if he's got more than one person asking you know? him. That board member who recognizes. Yeah, they called from my office phone yesterday. Uh, you can't talk right now, you will call my mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't 
Shall we give him a few minutes then? Sure. Or... So, yeah. Well, yeah, we need to wait. Ah, okay. He responded. He needs a phone number. Oh, yes, you can. I think I'm thinking on all the wrong stuff. It's when my fingers need to work right there. What you guys feel any better at college where we says pursuant to the open meetings act the requirement of five ILCS 127 a that a quorum of members of the board must be physically present at the location of the meeting shall not apply because five ILCS 127 B of the act specifically accepts local workforce innovation areas of a specified size from such requirements and authorizes them to permit attendance by other means in accordance with procedural rules such as those contained herein. Specifically, board and committee members may attend by video and or audio conferencing or by other electronic means for form and voting purposes on social media. And that is unintentional. That's not something that was put into place for mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. or uh, no, no, that's what it's, this is specific to local workforce board and mm -hmm. local workforce areas. So yes, that's good. Thank you. Okay. I got the phone number. If he's gonna call in, I don't think he's linking in from a <clears throat> device, so I sent him the phone number. Just the text while he's that So that's what he was saying. Okay. Wait, you didn't tell you who? He didn't say who, that's what. Yeah. Well, well, awesome. well, it's not a top secret meeting. Yeah. 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 I wanted to see the picture. <laughs> I really haven't been off this. Is there a Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I Bill Burke and I am here. 
but um, eventually they do end up showing up. We see that those counties where the board members and the chief elected officials are not attending meetings are not engaged and they're receiving there's lower levels of participation of customers and incumbent worker training dollars in those counties. So just a reminder that your participation and attendance of these meetings, your engagement in all things that is workforce development directly impacts your counties. I know it doesn't always seem like it, but we see the proof in the pudding when we look at those um, county breakdowns, those monthly reports that go out in the newsletter. If you look at those monthly breakouts, you can track your counties, you know, those ones where you're attending and you're active and engaged, there are consistent dollars going to that county. Those that are not active and engaged, I see the dollars getting smaller and smaller. I'd like to know why, I mean, years ago, uh, <clears throat> these individuals were on a lot of committees. When you look down the, uh, well, I don't know if that's called the, the private sector, you have uh, one, two, three, four out of the whole group who actually belong to one committee. And there's a lot of them that don't belong to any committee. Uh, I'd like to start seeing some of these people uh, stop serving on committees also. And right now, if you look at, like you're talking about the oversight planning committee, kind of overseeing these uh, bids and contracts and awards, you have one person in the uh, private sector Everybody else is in the public sector. Mm -hmm. It sits on the committee tops. Mm -hmm. Yes, Jeff, you're on the planning oversight. Tony, was there a change in policy where we started having fewer committee responsibilities? Not fewer responsibilities. A long time ago, I think what you're talking about, we had committees to have a committee to that committee. So we had 29 people or whatever on the board. So you had a, those committees were. We had room for people to be on committees. Now we've got one committee, really. We've got one in the oversight. Because the consortium is made up of all the required partners. So board members are welcome to come to those, but to be a member of it, no, well, that's for the that's for the partners. So we've got rid of you know, we used to have a planning committee and then an oversight committee, which is two committees we supplied to. So and to have the committee. You know well just well as I do on the committee. If you have too many people in there, okay. you're not going to get anything done in the press. So, and corn is a problem. And then there's still term limits. There are. So, everybody's got their three year term limit for everybody. And this is going to be the first year, I think, in our bylaw to set up these folks to serve for at least three consecutive terms. That's to take one year off. So, is that going to be? That only drives only privacy. Because the public sector, those people that are approved and report to our board fully are really appointed by their agency. And then the CEOs as a whole just kind of have to approve that. But to get somebody from an agency to serve on the unless their superiors It's changed from, yes, in the past we had a lot of those committees. Now we're going to just like to see more people engaged and taking the initiative to be on, especially the How many people do you want on that? Because then you're never going to get a piece, you're never going to get a form. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Whether it was via Zoom or in person. So, you want to be on it? No. That's it. I'll go on every committee I think you've ever seen. Go ahead. I've been here a lot. Um, While I have you guys here, can I confirm your county board schedules with you? Um, so one, I would like to be able to get to a point where we can visit your county boards, maybe do a presentation, but also for those who are not actively engaged, if I need to find them. I know where to find them. Um, so 
Debbie helped me look at all of our 13 counties and try to find the schedule. So I just want to confirm with you while I have you here. Clark County, are you the third Friday of every month at 8 a.m.? That's been bold. Okay. How about Clay County? <laughs> How about Coles County? Second Tuesday of the month at 7 p.m.? Yes. Awesome. Crawford County, second Thursday of the month at 6 p.m.? Correct, as long as it's after the 10th of the month. Okay, so sometimes it's a third Thursday. Yes, ma'am. Wonderful. Cumberland, second Tuesday of the month at 7 p.m.? Yes. Edgar, second Wednesday of the month at 9 a.m.? Yep. Effingham is not here. Okay, it's not here. Jasper, second Thursday of the month at seven. Third Thursday at six. Third Thursday at six p.m. Awesome. Lawrence, third Wednesday of the month at four. Correct. Marion, second and fourth Tuesdays of the month at seven. Six thirty. Six thirty. Uh, Moultrie is not here. And Richland is not here. All right. We also have study sessions regularly scheduled the second and fourth Mondays at 9 a.m. Study sessions, and that could be a good spot for a presentation. And that was 9 a.m. on what Thursdays? Monday. Oh. The first, the second and fourth Wednesdays of the month. Well, let's just say 9 30. 9 30. All right, awesome. And you're welcome with any questions. Thank you, I appreciate that. That is a goal for this year. It was a goal last year, but it's led to the bottom of my goals. This year it is a higher priority to get to all 13 of the county board. All right, number, um, let's see. Okay, so number seven, any old or new business? Hearing none, uh, public comment. Number nine, closing remarks. Just the next meeting is June 17th. I have a motion to adjourn. Second. Any second? I second. You think that we have a second? Okay. Thank you. No. All in favor. Uh, no, I'm good. Thank you so much, Bill, for joining us remotely. I appreciate it. You have a wonderful evening and um, good luck with in Texas. <laughs>